is Tuesday. It is Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, didn't see that one coming, did you? I was in, no, I didn't. That no. was enjoyable. No. Thank you. You're, you're so welcome. <laughs> Oh, it was like a tidal wave. Speaking <laughs> of which, tidal oh. wave. Oh, I, yeah, Raquel has got like, there's just so many, <laughs> bad jokes. There's so many bad dad jokes. Um, uh, we've been waiting so long to speak to Crystal, Richard, haven't we? Yes. Yes, we have. And we fell in love with her from our inbox. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Love from an inbox. Uh, Crystal, Richard is uh, an incredible um uh, a human being just what she has so many hats she works in public relations we talk about public relations we talk about you know her passion projects in marine conservation whales um how she really digs deep if you ever wondered about what actually it looks like from the other side of the lens from a pr perspective uh, or if you ever wondered whether or not pr is is something that you or your business or the people you work with uh, could use i think this is an incredible episode for you not only in terms of work life balance um, from a from a life design perspective but also from actually what does it actually mean to tell your own story how do you find that team to help you do that because she's had such huge placements she's had gq she's i mean i can't even list all of the things um that she has uh she's done for her clients and she tells the stories about some of them being still working in their basement some of them being huge international internationally acclaimed award-winning um physicians and 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 you know people across the board from a variety of walks so no matter what world you kind of live in and work in this is an episode that's really going to help you start thinking about how to create space for that aspect of your team. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other side of the conversation that we had was really about designing the life that you want. So she's been able to design her life in a way where she can really make the most of her passions and really live bravely. So, mm. you know, moving to the beat of her own drum, which was such an awesome takeaway. So yeah, I think this with you guys. Yeah. The best sentence was dare to go after it. That was my favorite yeah. sentence. Yeah. So without further ado, it is our absolute joy to introduce you to Crystal Richard. You're listening to Bombshell Brunches, where your hosts Raquel Rodenberg and Christina Lau sip and spill with badass babes every Tuesday morning. Oh, hello. <laughs> we, I am so happy that we get to have this conversation. Crystal, Richard, we've known for like, I don't know, five minutes and, uh, but also through recommending uh, Dr. Ashley Margison. And, uh, and ever since we email interacted with her, we just fell in love. So we've just been having a really cool, like green virtual green room conversation, uh, beforehand. And, and I am so excited to have this, uh, have this brunch with you, Crystal, uh, Crystal is the award-winning entrepreneur and publicist behind Crystal Richard, uh, Crystal Richard & Co. is a global digital PR company helping entrepreneurs get the dreamy media coverage they deserve. She's also the creator of Digital PR School and coaches business owners on how to rock their own media outreach. Crystal has secured media placements for her clients in leading online publications such as Forbes, Cosmo, The Globe and Mail, GQ, Business Insider, Entrepreneur, Inc., Chantelaine Magazine, and more. She's the founder of travel and lifestyle brand East Coast Mermaid. Crystal donates a portion of her profits to various ocean conservation organizations annually, including the Campobello Whale Rescue Team. You and I have to have a conversation because I just read my first audio book that is all about marine life and marine oh. conservation. Yes. We need to talk about that. So then. we'll talk about that because you we just have all the things. So so clearly Crystal is like a very lazy, unambitious, <laughs> unmotivated uh human that just wants to serve herself. <laughs> I'll take it because I would have said maybe psychos with all of the stuff I have going on. So that sounds much more pleasant. <laughs> just lazy, just silly. Um but Crystal, honestly, like We've been, we've just adored you from the second we met you. And, uh, and I just want you to take a minute and say hi to our, how do I, hi to our babes as in our audience. 
Hello. Hello. I'm, I am so pumped to be here. Like I said, as a publicist, I'm always, I mean, I emailed you about Dr. Ashley and as a publicist, I'm my own worst publicist when it comes to actually doing anything for myself. I'm always helping other people get famous. So I was really excited when you said you wanted to chat because I have stories too. So <laughs> yeah. And we want yeah. those stories. We want we them. Want Las Vegas, baby. We want that story. <laughs> oh God. I forgot that I mentioned Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, go start with Vegas. Let's just, let's just start large. This is going to, I hope you all have mimosas in hand or teas or whatever it is that, that, that jazzes you up today. Get ready. I have fizzy water. That, that's Great. my afternoon, my afternoon drink. Las Vegas. Um, how did I end up in Las Vegas? So I, it, it, it's a good thing you mentioned the saving the whales and the ocean stuff, because honestly, starting out, I mean, I was that kid that I'd go to the movie theater and I'd see a movie and then I'd decide I was going to pursue that career. So Jurassic Park, I was going to be a paleontologist. Twister, I was going to be a tornado chaser. Uh, definitely wanted to be a Hollywood actress for a while. I was going to study volcanoes. So I was a very, I was easily influenced as a child. But the one thing I kept coming back to was I was a total beach bum, always spent my summers on the ocean, in the water. And so I went to university thinking I was going to do marine biology. And I did a couple internships and realized working in a lab and not seeing anyone for a whole day and sorting through fish guts wasn't as glamorous as it looked. Um, I think I had this idea of like Jessica Alba and into the blue and, and living on this Bahama <laughs> Island and Paul Walker. And just, it, was, it wasn't as exciting in Canada as it was in the movies. So. I think it's just not as exciting if you're not Jessica Alba either. Like I just know, being right? that person, you're like, okay, well, I could do anything. I'm just I know. And even her. now she, she has a startup. So she clearly also was like, you know what, Hollywood, not as fun. I'm just going to go start a million dollar, billion dollar, I think now startup. Um, so I kind of, you know, the first couple of years of university, I was flunking out of classes. I wasn't really feeling it. And so I thought, okay, I need to, I need to reassess. And so I decided to do psychology um, to keep my science degree and then add some business in. And I'd always been a fan of Las Vegas. My parents started taking me there when I was in high school for my dad always had conferences there. And I was really fascinated with this whole idea of, you know, Las Vegas and 24 hour days and casino life. And so after university, I thought, okay, maybe I want to do casino marketing. I used to think being a casino host looked very glamorous. So decided to apply for this summer travel program to go to Las Vegas, basically lived a summer that was like a season of, of the hills pretty much. I made my friends laying by the pool at this condo I had rented that I really couldn't afford. But if I was going to go to Vegas, I was going to go big or nothing at all. So I graduated from university. I, I left the guy I was dating at the time back in Canada, me and my cat and two suitcases went to Las Vegas for one and summer. And your cat, wait, you took yeah. your cat and you're like, okay, cat, it's time. We're going to yeah. live large. This cat's like, what? Yeah. I'm happy. And, and even to, well, she was only about six months old at the time so she was still a kitten or on the plane the flight attendants like bringing her tuna because they had these snack packs I remember and we we're flying delta and I was like oh I'm gonna order this snack pack that has a can of tuna and I told the I literally told the flight attendant I was like I'm just doing this for my cat so we were giving the cat the tuna on the plate like it was quite quite glamorous that was probably okay did you when she peaked <laughs> Did you, did you wear like giant glasses and like hold your cat and like this, like, did you like swan onto that oh plane and be like, God, I'm ready? I, no, I <laughs> wish I had. I actually pulled up the picture of me at the airport and like, I texted my best friend and I was like, why, how did you ever let me dress like this and look like this? And it, it was a real travesty. So no, it wasn't glamorous. But then once I, you know, got to Vegas and then met friends and stuff. And the next thing you know, it's like party all day. And, and it was, it was, it was a wild summer, but I, I came back to Canada and I'm really glad I did it. Um, but it was definitely, it's, it's exhausting, but it's a whole other world down there. I mean, you're at the grocery store and, you know, you've got an Elvis impersonator in the next aisle over and a showgirl that still has all of her makeup and stuff done, you know, picking out a kale salad. And so it was quite, uh, it was quite the experience. I actually also got to wait on Michael Jackson on what was his last birthday with his two kids, which was 
that's like my claim to fame in life. So oh, that's, yeah, I know. I saw that and, and uh, no one believed you until no. they saw it in the magazines. In People magazine, all of my friends were like, well, how come you don't have a picture? Now, first of all, I had a pink razor phone back then. So it's not like it took the <laughs> most glamorous photos. Oh um, my gosh. This was before, I mean, this was summer 2008. So it was before, you know, Instagram and uh, Facebook was a thing, but Um, so they were like, well, you don't have a picture. And I said, I wasn't even allowed to like really say anything. It was very much go to the table, drop things off. Uh, we did a little happy birthday and that was it. And then people magazine, they got the exclusive to come and take a picture to put in the magazine that he had his 50th birthday. And, uh, it wasn't until that issue came out that my friends back in Canada started texting me and they're like, Oh, like, you weren't lying. And I was like, I've never lied about a thing in my life. Why would I start now? Yeah. And why Michael Jackson of all the things, like you could have lied about Jessica Alba. I could have. You could have like had other lies. There were other, (laughs) other lies that were more suited to your (laughs) your personality. So I think it was just, but it was, it was that kind of summer. Like one of my friends that I was hanging out with was dating Chris Angel mind freak at the time. So you know, I'd, I'd be going to these pools and getting bar service and everything and a cabana compliments of Chris Angel. And so my friends, I, I think they just thought that, like I said, it was literally like a season of the Hills with this little Canadian girl that <laughs> didn't know anything. And her cat. And her cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so what was, what was the decision? Like you talked about in t- being intuitive and making choices intuitively. So you also talked about how at that time, your friends were finishing university and starting careers and families, and you decided to while out in Vegas. So <laughs> what? how did you know that this was your thing, that wiling out in Vegas was the thing that you needed to yeah. do? So the Vegas story is interesting because like I said, I, I, this goes way back. So back in the nineties, there was a movie with Sarah Jessica Parker, Nick Cage, (laughs) James Caan. It was called honeymoon in Vegas. And when I saw that movie at my aunt and uncle's, when I was a kid, I think it was like the parents were partying and they were like, we're going to go put this movie on for crystal in the basement. I was an only child. So I really had a lot of spare time on my hands to have an imagination and, and, (laughs) you know, watch movies and stuff. So I kind of became fascinated it. And the first time my parents were going without me, I was like, oh, okay, well, this sucks. I don't get to go to Vegas. Then they were going again when I was 16 and I really wanted to go. Coincidentally, in my one of my, I think it was my French class, we had to do a debate. So I decided to do my debate on why it's perfectly acceptable for parents to bring their 16-year-old to Las Vegas. Like my teacher thought I was batshit crazy. Like what 16 year olds like I'm gonna do a debate about why Vegas is a family destination (laughs) so (sighs) it kind of started there and I guess in university you know I I spent a lot of time at the casino there I was dating a poker player at the time so I was really kind of caught up in that whole that world and that glamour and that excitement and um I don't know I think subconsciously I knew that I wasn't going to end up marrying this guy I wasn't going to stay there And I thought, you know, this is my chance if I don't go now and just kind of do things on my own terms. When I come back, I'm going to have to face the music. I'm going to have to get a real job and start paying back, you know, all of the student debt I've racked up over the years. So I think in my mind, it was just this, you know, opportunity to just kind of escape. And it was probably the best thing I did because, you know, I, I did come home, dumped the boyfriend and then totally went through like that phase in my life where I moved back with my parents, had no job. Uh, still had the cat. She was thriving. And, uh, you know, then I was like, oh shit, what did I do? Like I went to Vegas. I got really used to drinking bottle surface every night and hanging out with celebrities. And I really had to figure things out. But I think if I hadn't have sort of gone against the status quo, I don't know if I would have necessarily gotten to where I am today as an entrepreneur. I mean, a lot of the things I've done in my life are from, you know, dating the wrong person, making a bad decision that got me to a place where I really figured out what I wanted, who I wanted to be. And it all kind of led to here. So I want to just jump in on that because it sounds like you, I think you said like, I I can't remember what the word was that you just used, but I think you created space to explore. 
Yeah. You know, like when you went to Vegas, like I love that you like lived your life through through movies and we do that through film and through the, you know, the media that we we look at and we're like, I could do this, I could do that, which is why, you know, Raquel and I speak a lot about representation being so important um, mm-hmm. in so many capacities, but you created a space for you to have an adventure without yeah. uh, an attachment to an outcome from that adventure. And I think creating enough, I mean, Raquel does this all the time. I say that because she's in South Africa right now um, and not in Amsterdam trying to get back. Um, But, you know, both her and I have done that over our lives where it's like, I'm going to throw this thing, this, this up to the universe. And then if it flies, I'm flying with it. Like, and I will deal it with it on the way. And I love that you did that with Vegas at a time where you, you both, I mean, you can do it at any time in your life, but you did it at such a time that you were okay and had come to terms and settled into letting that be whatever it was going to, but knowing in your guts, that was where you needed to be at that point. That's great. Oh yeah. And I mean, I look back, did I do anything casino marketing related? No, I did. I (laughs) did nightclub promo and I waitressed. Um, but it, I think I needed that summer to, you know, have those experiences and, and do yeah. something that scared me. And, and to this day, I, I really am big on doing things that scare me. And I, I was actually thinking about this yesterday when I was out for a walk and thinking about how, because we haven't been traveling with, because of COVID, I used to be one of those people, I would get on a plane, I would go places and I wouldn't even think twice. One of my clients, uh, three years ago had a surf retreat for entrepreneurs in Peru. And when we started working together, they were like, so you should come down to Peru. And my first thought was, I can't just go to Peru for three weeks. Like, oh, what about Dan? What about Bella, the cat? Uh, You know, never mind the fact that they were totally fine. And so, (laughs) but I I paused for a second. I'm thinking, I can't just go to Peru. But then two weeks earlier, when it was January 1st, I had put in, you know, my New Year's intentions, go to a new country literally Mm. two weeks before that. And so I'm like, yeah, I can go to Peru and then I can add a trip to Machu Picchu while I'm down there and all of this. And so I used to do that all the time. And I was thinking yesterday, I said, you know, as soon as it's good to go to kind of move around and travel again, I need to get back on that because I don't want to lose that part of me that I've loved since I was a little girl of not being afraid to book a plane ticket and Mm. go do these wild things. Even if everyone else is like, that doesn't make sense. You should be home and having babies and doing all kinds of other things. And I just kind of always went the other way. Yeah. And Vancouver will be your first stop. I'm just going to put that out there. (laughs) Raquel is here for summer. Uh, Hopefully we're hoping we're fingers crossing. Um, So if that's the case, then, and we'll, we'll do our own personal bottle service for you and just (laughs) just have mimosas on, you know, and, uh, and, and go to a patio and live large. Uh, Um, Vancouver Lodge, not Vegas Lodge, because I mean, let's be honest, I go to sleep at 930. Uh, so. I do too now. So I, I don't think I, that was definitely a whole other part of my life that kept me out until six o'clock in the morning every day. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. My face would be melting off if that was the case right now. Um, so, so how lead us then to PR, what happened then? We came back from Vegas, went, Oh my life. Yeah. And then. So, so, okay. So this is where things get even like weirder and you guys are getting the full like mm. uncensored scoop here. So, I love it. Um, so yeah, so I came back home and really came back to Canada, dumped the boyfriend, um, w- moved back home. To, Cause at the time I had my, when I left Canada, I was in Nova Scotia. I just graduated from Dal. And so I came back to Canada, came back home to Moncton and moved back home with my parents. Uh, so found myself, you know, 25, 26 living with my parents and thinking, okay, I might've messed this one up. Like everybody else was buying houses and getting married. I was single and living with my parents again. And so I kind of thought, okay, you know, I need to, I need to figure this out. So there was a casino opening in Moncton at the time where I live and they had this really great position of a responsible gambling counselor. And so because I had a psychology degree, but I also had Las Vegas experience, I kind of was this unicorn candidate that they literally were like, where did you come from? We didn't expect someone in a town of 100,000 people to have Las Vegas casino experience and a psych degree. So I took that job. But at the same same time, I was like, hey, I, I did not want to be counseling for a living. And it wasn't you know, what I really wanted. Uh, but again, I say everything happens for a reason. My coworker at that job, uh, who is now one of my best friends and going to be one of my bridesmaids in my wedding this summer, 
she and I met and I had a fortune cookie a couple days before I started the job saying I was going to meet my new best friend at work. And that literally came true. I still have the fortune cookie in my like memory box. Oh my God. I love that. But so her, her husband, or I guess at the time they weren't even married yet. Um, he was working for this startup and he was like, oh, you know, my boss is single. Like we should all go out sometime. So I started dating her boyfriend at the time's boss. And that really introduced me to startup world. I didn't even know what a startup was. This was around the time that um, I, I remember dating it as Instagram had just come out because they all had Instagram because they were in that startup world. Um, and I became fascinated with startups. And I thought, oh, this is cool. Like I was seeing all of these people that were creating jobs on the internet, um, creating apps, creating content. And I thought I could do that. So I started approaching entrepreneurs that I knew in the city and saying, Hey, I see you have a Facebook page or you don't have a Facebook page. Can I create a Facebook page for you? So I started just doing some really freelance social media website copy. Um, and the great thing was I could do all of this at the casino because the casino had just opened. So as bad as it sounds, we didn't really have a ton of people with gambling problems flooding in yet because the casino had just <laughs> opened. So no one had really recognized there was an issue. Um, so I had a lot of downtime. So I was like, okay, I will, you know, take on this freelance job. And so I could, and I was working every in the evening. So I had daytime to work on my freelance gig. And that's kind of how I stumbled into PR. And I discovered, wow, you know, this is a whole world. I made mentors. I talked to people. I self-taught myself a lot and then somehow found myself becoming director of PR at an agency that specialized in startup PR here in my city, working with, you know, Silicon Valley tech startups. Um, and that's kind of how I started out in PR. And then about four years later, that's around the time um, I met my now fiance. And I think there was a combination of meeting my lobster, my person, and just there was, there was definitely a transformation. When he met me, I was still that I work for someone else. I work, you know, a hundred hours a week. Um, like full disclosure, I got shingles literally three months, not even, I think it was like two months after we had started dating. Cause I was so burnt out at work, so burnt out and so exhausted. And I had wow. just started dating someone and I'm like, Oh my God, this is really embarrassing. But it was a wake up call that did I want to do an agency? And I know we've, we've in emails talked about agency life and, and what that looks like. And yeah. I say that when I met him, I think that really helped me realize some in some weird way that I wanted more, that I wanted to take control of my own adventure again. And so that's really what helped me turn to entrepreneurship and, you know, to go out on my own. I, I just, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, Raquel and I know this really great doctor that specializes in, in hormones. We, we can, yeah. we can make an introduction if you like. Her name's Dr. Ashley Margeson. I was literally talking to her yesterday. I was like, so, cause we, we were chatting and I was getting, it was, it was quite hot out yesterday. And I was like, Oh, and she's like, are you having hot flashes? Do we need to talk? And I was like, yeah, we really should get on that at some point. I know I'm my own worst. I talk to her every day and I'm like, help me help my hormones. <laughs> help me help my hormones. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because you must have such an incredible kind of uh, Rolodex of, of people that can help yeah. with so many things. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. But she, I would say she's probably one of the more valuable ones that I'm like, <laughs> okay. And, and we have mutual friends. I mean, we were friends first. I met her through one of my other really good friends, um, that she has also helped, you know, cure. <laughs> so I had heard wow. amazing things before we even started working together. And, uh, the amount of people that I know personally that she's changed their life, it's, it's crazy. So yeah. She's yeah. A good person to know. Yeah. We'll, we'll put a sh link to her, her episode again in the show notes. Um, but I, I just, I want to keep going back to the, to the PR side of it, because we, we have an episode on the worst jobs that we've both ever had. And, and, and both of us worked in PR. Mine was one of the worst yeah. jobs I've ever had. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and we talked about the, and it was hilarious and I learned so much. And I think that's, again, what, what I'm, I'm really hearing from you is you're really, you're following that current and then 
And then surfing the wave of serendipity is what I wrote in my little notes here, um, just to tie it oh back gosh. into that Marie. I know, I know, it's right? Very it's very on so brand for uh, me right, too, thank surfing you. the wave. Right, exactly. Yes. I know, it just washed up into my brain. Um, pun intended. This, so, is, this is my life though. Like uh, yeah, my yeah. fiance came in this <laughs> today and I have this random post-it that I want to do something with that says, hold your seahorses instead of like, hold your horses, <laughs> hold your seahorses. <laughs> Because I was like, I need to do something with that. And he's uh, like, hold your seahorses. I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Away. That's so great. I feel like there needs to be like PR, PR uh, riff offs, you know, like, like in rap battles where they're like, how can you out pun or like, how can you create yes. this spin? How can you spin this branding in a certain way? Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting to take it drifting away with the currents. Uh, so what I was going to say is that, uh, In the episode, we talked about the experience of having to do PR for companies that didn't have a story, you know, and cold calling journalists for products that weren't newsworthy. I mean, I I was trying to sell a baby in all bag, which might have been newsworthy. I'm pretty sure it was just because I was useless. Um, But then, you know, serendipitously, we literally, Raquel and I were talking about this like the day before. And I looked at my our, our emails and I was like, babe, you'll never guess what just happened. We have this person. <laughs> this is exactly how I said it as well. We have this person that I don't know. Do you know this person? She's the PR person. We were just having this conversation yesterday. Um, and Raquel's like, Poof, okay, wow, serendipity, we love. Um, what you do PR, you know, Raquel says this. This is these are Raquel's words. I am a hundred percent quoting Raquel. You do PR the way that PR needs should be done. Um, and thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for doing it the way it should be done. <laughs> Um, but because, and I'll, I'll tell the babes as this, um, because when I read your email, I'm a really big advocate of good community, good, solid, clear communication. And when you had, and relationship building. So when you had written, you didn't just say, hi, I'm from this company. I really, I've got these guests. Can I write to you and let you know? You were like, hi, I listened to this one. This is what I loved about this episode. This is why I think this person is a fit for you. Um, I'm sorry to just drop in or whatever you had said was just so warm. And we'll, we'll get to kind of unpacking that later, but, but right now you, but you really hooked us. Um, and, and what I wanted to do with you right now is, is because we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of audience that are starting up or working in companies that are very creative and they might not know what, and individuals and myself, like I need to, to figure out having, doing, doing so many different things with so many different hats. How do you help someone develop that story? How do you do, yeah. how do you do that? And then, and then we'll get into supporting them, but how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, it's narrowing it down to what you want to talk about. So people, if they have a product, if they have a service, everyone, if you have something you're selling, We tend to think that we need to focus on that when in reality, journalists, podcast hosts, whoever it is, they don't want to necessarily talk about a product. They want to talk about people, humans, stories. Mm. So how can you take what you're trying? It's it's still okay to think about what do you want to promote, but how do you turn that into a story? Mm -hmm. So in the case of someone like Dr. Ashley, you know, we pitch a lot of stuff about burnout and it's figuring that's kind of the, 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 area that she wants to touch upon. So how do we build stories to do that? So think about what it is that you want to talk about. Um, You know, for me as a PR person, if I want to pitch PR, it doesn't necessarily have to be, here's five ways to get your business in the media. It could be something even bigger, you know, here's what happened when I put focus on myself and shared my story and was raw and honest. And then this happened, like you can tell a story. So I think it's really that it's to, to give you the exact step-by-step you'd kind of, I need to know the business and the actual story, but it really comes down to storytelling. And Mm -hmm. I think PR people think it has to be cold pitches all of the time. I refuse to send a cold pitch. I, you know, I was working on an influencer campaign for a client this morning before I reach out to each influencer as an influencer myself, I know how I want to be treated. I'm taking time. I'm checking out their Instagram posts. I'm, you know, commenting on a recipe they've shared recently. I'm watching their stories. I'm doing something to connect with them because nobody wants to get an email from someone that's a cold pitch asking them to do something. I mean, this is 
it takes time for you to create a podcast episode to interview someone. It's the same thing with the journalist. You need to give them a good story because mm. what people don't realize is that when you're pitching a journalist, they already have assigned articles that their editors have given them. Chances are, if they're a freelancer or a contributor, they might call their own shots, but oftentimes they already have a workload. So every time you send a pitch, you're not necessarily doing them a favor. In some cases, you're actually creating more work for them. So what right. is something that you can tell and share that's so freaking compelling that their listeners, their audience, their editors are going to be like, oh yeah, okay, you need to write that. Like that's worth the extra two to three hours it might take you to do this. That's where it comes. Like you can't pitch them something that's boring. You have to be thoughtful in your approach. Thank you. <laughs> Because <laughs> I remember I went to school for PR. So I have a diploma in public relations and then I went back for communications and now I'm back for persuasive communications on the science side. But um, when I was in school for PR, I remember them saying like, you're doing, they, they verbalized it. Like you're doing them this big favor. They don't have enough time to write their own stories, essentially just write the story and send it out to them. And I remember sitting there just <laughs> like, that sounds like the worst advice ever. I don't want to like, that sounds so annoying. And if I was a journalist on the other side of that, that would really aggravate me. I would ignore it. I would trash it. And I would probably not want to get any more emails from that person. And I think <clears throat> at the end of the day, a lot of people will get excited about their product because that's their passion or their service. And that's their passion. And um, they think that that should be enough. They think that that is unique enough. And I would say a small percentage is something that's actually newsworthy enough. It doesn't mean that's not cool or good or that you don't have a great product, but in order for it to be newsworthy, um, that's a whole different story. Mm. You can have the best product in the world and it could not be newsworthy. Um, you know, it's not saying your product's not good, but that's being newsworthy is a whole different thing. And I found that was a big education piece when I was doing PR for clients was just to educate them on that. So what you're saying about the stories and the stories having a personal connection is so bang on. And that's, yeah. that's what people want to read about. That's what people get excited about. They want the journey. They want the story. And yeah, I just, I absolutely loved you immediately. Like, and you were so you. <laughs> <You're, Yeah. laughs> it was the best. <laughs> but oh, that makes yeah. me so happy. <laughs> it's such a and complicated thing. I, and, and I felt that when I worked in an agency, you don't have time to do that. You, when you work in an agency, you have to get as many pitches out as possible. It's a numbers game. It's get as much out. Chances are, and I'm not just speaking from experience. I've heard this from other, you know, agency breakaways. Um, chances are your clients think they have you for 40 hours a week and you've got 10 clients that all think that. So you have all of these clients that think you're pitching them eight to five, Monday to Friday probably on the weekends. I mean, I remember back in my agency life being at the late show for a movie theater and a client calling me and I had to duck out of the 10 o'clock show in a movie theater because they were calling me on a Friday night about some crisis that, you know, it wasn't even important, but to be that person that's telling my friends, like, sorry, I just need to go take this phone call. It was crazy. And so when I went out on my own, I always tell people I'm the opposite of an agency. I'm not going to pass you off to a junior PR person. You just get me, you get my experiences. And I'm not saying I pitch like a turtle, but I pitch pretty damn slow. I take time to get to know people. I'm that yeah. might mean on some days I might only get out, you know, one or two pitches every hour because I've taken the time to actually dedicate to that. And yeah, it's, but there's so many people out there who are are still doing it that old school way. And it just, it feels very, very icky. It feels yes. disingenuous. I think yeah. that's the big thing. And because Raquel and I have spoken so much about having such an in, like such inundation when it comes to media and, and, and content and all of these things, it's like, you know, in, in a way it's really pushing you to, to, to dig deeper. You know, Raquel does an incredible job and I, you know, I don't give her enough credit 
all the time. So the amount of work she puts into researching and finding the right questions for the scripts, because I'm a riffer. I will, I will go with whatever I need to go with. But Raquel really sits there and says, why do we want to say this? Why is this important? Why is, you know, what do we want to ask that's going to bring out a deeper question or bring out that, that greater? So, you know, compliments for Raquel today. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I do want to also say what kind of client could come to you, you know, like what, so, yeah. you know, we talk a lot about does, our, our podcast, really, um, a friend of ours, Laura at Optic TV, uh, shout out to Optic TV, uh, mentioned that it feels like life design. You know, we do a lot of conversations about life design and, uh, and we're talking about building a team. So as a creative, as an entrepreneur or someone who's really taking control, um, of, of their own, of their own life and building a team, at what point do we enlist you? You know, at yeah. what point does someone and what type of person, where are they at? What, what do they need to be able to afford? What kind of achievements have they had? Yeah. So one of the biggest things, and I was, I was using this example with someone today, I've worked with companies that literally have yet to even sell a single product, but they had a story, which again, mm. it all comes back to the story. Um, but when I talk about that surf retreat for entrepreneurs, when we first started working together, uh, they were both very experienced in the tech space. They were working with an amazing customer research um, consultant who I was friends with. And so she said, you know, you need to do PR. You want to sell three months worth of packages to people around the world from Halifax, Nova Scotia. You need to do PR. So within about a month or two working together, I had them in GQ as one of the family or friend fitness friendly vacations for that year. It came out right after new year's. So it was the perfect for people that were like, what do we want to do this year? Uh, we had them at jet setter. We had them at Forbes, but the crazy thing was they had never actually had someone, they weren't even in Peru yet. They were flying down to Peru to start getting ready. But the first participant wasn't arriving until February. And they already had all of this media coverage talking about how amazing they were Wow! when they didn't even have a customer testimonial or a customer review to go with. And so I use that example that if you have created something epic and something with an awesome story for them, it was that they were, they were surf bums who anytime they would travel for surfing, the biggest problem pain point they would have was getting reliable Wi-Fi. They still wanted to be able to run their businesses and mm. surf from these sweet little remote towns, whether it be Bali or Peru or wherever, but getting really great Wi-Fi was a problem. So they found this place, they knew the people there, they had gone there before, had friends, and they were able to set up this little hub where you had your own apartment that had super awesome Wi-Fi. There was a co-working space with super awesome Wi-Fi, but they dealt with that big problem that any digital nomad or entrepreneur has experienced of like, you're trying to take a conference call and you don't have good Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. that was a huge story that why they had created it. So I mean, for myself, it's really, I've worked with people in their first year of business. I've worked with startups that have been around for over five years that have never thought about PR. It's very different for everyone. Um, mm. Sometimes a startup calls me when they're starting to think about raising money. Sometimes it's after they've raised money. So they've, they've done their, you know, their funding and they think, okay, now we can afford to bring on a publicist. Um, I've also worked in some capacities with business owners that are still working out of their basement. One of my clients that I had a blast working with last year, uh, Eclair Lips, she has a lip balm company. She literally, because of co they did have a commercial space and then they moved it back home when COVID hit, her and her husband ship lip balm around the world. Uh, they're in over 500 stores in North America and they're still making those lip balms in their basement. So oh, amazing. Someone like her, you know, we got her an Elite Daily before Christmas as an awesome stocking stuffer idea because they did these really cute ones called Kiss 2020 Goodbye. That was like <laughs> the perfect lip balm. Uh, now she has one, I think it's called Kiss Me I'm Vaccinated, which is awesome. <laughs> but and they have one for nurses too. I think it's first we moisturize, then we save the lives for nurses and healthcare workers. And so they have these really quirky, clever, they're genius. And so people love them around the world, but she is still running that business from her basement with her husband while homeschooling two girls. Someone wow. like her might think I, you know, I'm not ready for PR. Who am I to get PR? But she went for it and said, you know, I'm going to do this. And we've got her some awesome coverage on CBC and, and elite daily. And so there isn't necessarily a single type. I think the biggest thing is if you dare to go after it, 
because I mm. think that's what holds a lot of people back. They think that PR is only for companies making millions of dollars, uh, the unicorns of the world, and that if they're just running a small business from their basement, that, that might not be them. Um, there's definitely a PR person out there that you can find to work with. I know myself, I, you know, I do PR retainers. I also do PR coaching every once in a while. I'll do a little collectives or digital PR school that someone can just pay once and learn basically everything they need to know to do their own PR if they want to. So oh, I love that. It's, it's making, I mean, I knew that I didn't want to grow an agency because I still have like agency <laughs> stress disorder. I think when I, when I think back to that part of my life. Um, I wanted, I knew that I wasn't going to grow a team, so I can only work with so many people at once. So that's kind of what inspired me to start finding other ways to offer different ways I could work with people to help more people, especially female entrepreneurs. Yeah. Well, we will be having this conversation. (laughs) Yeah. I look forward to it. I think that really brings me back to building the life you want and daring to go after what you want, which was a big thing that I kept coming back to in talking to you. I mean, you left your PR agency in order to start your own PR company. Um, I know you talked about having your lifestyle brand, you have an apparel brand, and you were talking about how you set up your life in this way to basically be able to capitalize on your passion of whales and ocean (laughs) and ocean conservation. So can you talk about that? Like building your life to have space for your passion. I mean, some people work in their passion and some people build their life so that they can enjoy their passion. So can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. So I think, I mean, the passion thing, it, it started, I think when I was in my agency life, I knew I wanted to do something on my own. I didn't know necessarily I wanted to run a global PR business at the time. Uh, but the same about a couple months after I met Dan and we started dating, that was when East Coast Mermaid was born. It's actually going to turn five this June on the first day of summer, which is crazy. So I thought, you know what? I love blogging. I had been blogging since like university. We used to have live journal. I don't know if you remember live journal and you used to be able to put what music you were listening to. It was all very emo and dramatic because that was like the era of the Hills and the OC. And anyway, and so I thought, you know what? I loved, I love my province of New Brunswick. I love summers here. So I'm going to start doing blogs about, you know, going whale watching and Island hopping and lighthouses and all of this stuff. So I went on 99 designs. I paid $400 for this East coast mermaid logo, which at the time I just both threw up because I was like, I can't believe I spent $400 on like a digital file, like a JPEG. (laughs) (laughs) Like at the time it was a lot of money and it seemed crazy. So I was with my friends and they were like, well, you know, you can maybe put it on a tank top and just sell it to family and friends. And then maybe they'll buy it. And then you can make like half the $400 back. So that's what I did. And then next thing I knew, people were posting it on on social media and they were using like hashtag East Coast Mermaid and really embracing this idea of, you know, fearlessness and living your life the way you want and riding waves of serendipity and all of that. And I had strangers messaging me saying, you know, I need these tank tops. Can I meet you in a parking lot? So that moment I realized I had something. I met a family on their way from Ontario to Prince Edward Island on vacation. And I met them in a McDonald's parking lot where they handed me cash for all of this mermaid swag. And I thought, (laughs) okay, (laughs) this might be something. Mm -hmm. Um, So fast forward to February, that was when I started the PR business. And so I walked into my lawyer's office, incorporated the business. We all know that story. But then people were like, okay, what's next for this? You know, are you doing more tank tops? Are you going to have something for men? Are you going to like, what are you going to do this summer? And so I walked into my lawyer's office again that July and I said, I'm starting a second company. And he kind of laughed and said, oh, you were just here doing that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually I'm serious about this. Um, so that's when we started Sandy Toast Shop and we started, you know, adding men's stuff, kids stuff, the whole yard. We started, that was the beginning of our seafood apparel line. So now we have a lobster line, an oyster line, a fried <laughs> clams line, but That summer, we started Hamal Bound, which is Hamal, this French for lobster, and it's a play on homeward bound, lobster bound. But that (laughs) that T-shirt has been on the Food Network's shows. You know, it's shipped around the world. We get people that order it to send it to family from away. 
And it's become this staple collection that I've basically said, if I ever decided I didn't want to do Sandy Toes anymore, I would still keep that product alive because it's just become this beloved collection. But all of this was created just from my lifestyle. And, you know, I, I go back to thinking about how I wanted to be a, a, a movie star when I was a kid. And now it's like in this weird little way, I've been able to create this life that I get to share with people thanks to social media and give them a little piece of it with the, the apparel line or whatever it might be. And all of that was from passion and building this life based on those passions. Wow. That's just, yeah, it's just such a dream. And I think what's amazing is just being able to, you know, decide that you're going to do something, figure out how that's monetizable and then go for it. Yeah. And, and, you know, and really, and have that really, I think a lot of us, you know, myself included, I don't often, if I'm in a feeling of scarcity or a space of scarcity, I feel like I need to go hunting for money rather than I need to go, uh, I need to make space to allow opportunity. Um, and then have enough space to allow that opportunity to realize. And I think that's, you know, that's where I'm at in my career right now, where there are so many different strings. There are so many different bows, not even strings, but it's not the same bow, many bows. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and I want to feel like it's really inspiring to feel like it's possible to do that. And that's, that's something that I think is really, I'm at the you know, at, kind of at the start of is being like, Hey, well, you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this. And how can you do all of those things while feeling as authentic as someone that says I'm this as a career? Cause that's yeah. antiquated. That notion of being, you know, one dimensional in your career is, is antiquated. It's just that we're holding on to it in a lot of capacities. But the crazy thing is, and I've had this conversation with several people lately, is that when I started the second business and for the last couple of years, I had a lot of people that assumed one was an exit strategy for the other. So everyone would assume, you know, you're going to grow one to sell one mm. to then put all your time into the other. And I would tell people, well, no, if I get bored of one, I'll just stop doing it kind of thing. Yeah. Like even Sandy Toast, the apparel line, we really this year have, I've warned all of our fans, you know, I'm getting married this summer. We're not going, you know, balls to the wall this year. We're going to have a few little new things, but they've all been like, okay, well, whatever you do will make us happy. But <laughs> I had a lot of people that thought like, you know, you can't have more than one business. You have to mm. focus on one thing. There's a lot of bro marketers out there that are like, if you have a second, like you have to go all in on one thing or you're not passionate enough or you're, you know, if you yeah. want to make millions of dollars, you have to go all in on one thing. Well, for me, I still get it all done. Like on any given week, you know, in the summer, especially because summer is really my busy season. Cause that's kind of when the coastal apparel company takes off. Um, I calendar block the shit out of my calendar so that I know okay, here's all of the hours I have client work. And mm -hmm. then here's when I know I need to go to the post office or package orders or pick up stuff from the screen printers. Um, here's where, you know, we have a date night. Here's where I go look for sea glass. Like I have it all figured out so that no balls are dropped. And I think mm -hmm. as long as it's not burning you out to do all of the things and you recognize, okay, this might need to go on the back burner. Like for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I was away and I got an idea for an, a book I really want to write, a fiction. I used to write like fictional novels back in my day. I was I used to write a really good romance novel and then I just got busy and started two companies. Sorry, did you just say I used to write fiction novels, plural, back yeah. in the day? Yeah, I have a couple I never really did anything with that I probably should at some point. A couple that you didn't. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah sure. So with I all that spare time. For this other one. And I was like, hey. Like I looked at my calendar and I'm like, all right, you, these characters are just going to have to stay in here until like at least after the wedding. <laughs> um, but that's how I approach everything. It's like, if I get a new idea of something I want to do, I make sure I can do it without burning myself out with, with still getting those eight hours of sleep that I know I need. Actually, it's more like nine. I really like sleeping. Yeah. I like sleeping too. I'm an eight hour person as well, but I, I, I like that you really, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same. And I think Raquel is as well. Like we're really starting to add our personal lives into our calendar in a way that we didn't before. Um, yeah. and that, and, and really recognize what's, 
beneficial about doing that and that how that positively impacts the work that you the quote unquote work that you do in your career based your career based um work i should say yeah. but the other work the the health work the internal work the personal work that is also work and i i think that's i think really starting to understand how much time your projects really do take is one thing that I'm hearing from you is that you're really good at doing that. And I think I'd encourage our audience to, um, to really think about how they are investing their time. I really don't like saying spending time anymore because I don't want to spend it. I want to invest it. Um, and I, and I think that that's a really big part. And that's something that I'm really at right now is, is figuring out how to create enough space to even just take a step back and say, okay, all these things are currently happening. Um, but are they happening to the depth that I want them? Are they happening with the amount of space for me to build in for things to go awry, for things to, for new things to come in? You know, if someone comes to me and asks me to take on a project right now, I, I go into a state of panic rather than being like, oh, what a great, I, yeah, what a great um, proposal. I'll take a look at it. I'd love to, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 And I think also just having things play off each other, because I'm sure that doing the apparel line brings out a level of creativity and it mixes up your day differently than your client work where you're Absolutely. maybe sitting more, you know, you get to get up and you get to go out and you get to see people and um, you get to create. And I really think that plays off each other so well. I mean, I find that with a, with the podcast as well it plays off so nicely and I get yeah. so many more ideas. I get so much more creative talking to people um, that I can then pull that into my other career or my other school work and things like that. So I do think it's an antiquated idea to just have this one thing. Like it's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. And that's what I tell people. If I need a break, if I'm you know, trying to write a pitch or a press release and I'm just hitting a wall and the creativity is not coming, I'll take a step back. I'll say, okay, do I have any orders to pack? If so, I'll go do that. Uh, maybe I'll take a break and run to the post office. So it gives you this other creative outlet that's not the main outlet. And then you can sort of choose the, what I love about that business is that it really is kind of cut blanche to do whatever I want. And so that's sort of where the whale, saving the whales came in. Um, I don't take a salary from that company. So we donate a portion of our proceeds to the whale rescue team that's local here. That's actually, I've, I've met them. I've been out on boats with them um, and they do incredible work untangling right whales, which are, you know, there's less than 200 left in the world. They're incredibly endangered. Um, and they come into our waters and oftentimes they get tangled up in ghost gear and they'll either you know, die of starvation because they're, they're tangled or they're in distress. And this team actually goes out on a boat and rescues them. And so I thought, okay, like I could give to an ocean conservation program that, you know, is wide worldwide known, or I could actually give these people a check that would pay for gas to get the boat to the whale when they need it. Or, you know, our, our donation last summer actually helped them. It, it, they had gotten funding for a second boat and it actually helped get them over what they needed to get the second boat. And so that was an impact I couldn't have even imagined. So anytime I even think like, oh, maybe I won't bother with Sandy Toes this summer, I think, well, yeah, but it's a Shopify store. As long as you have stuff topped up in there and you, you know, have consistent orders that come in, that's all money that, you know, you can put back into the business and then you can help with the whales. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird, it's a really weird roundabout way. How, like I said, I went to university thinking I was going to save the whales in this other capacity, Jessica Alba style. <laughs> and then I, you know, found myself here today where my businesses are able to sort of, that's one of our charitable contributions that we do each year is to help this team and, and the impact that they make. Wow. Oh, <sighs> That's amazing. You're amazing. I don't even know what else to say. Like, I just got to go. I got to go away and listen. Yeah, we could just keep going. But I think I think that's a really great place to kind of to kind of wrap it up, though, to be honest, because like we, we just talked so much from like from creating enough space for you to adventure 
to, uh, you know, really capitalizing on the strengths that were starting to bubble up to really, to responding to serendipity, to, to taking that deep look into what you are most passionate about in what you do as well. And saying, you know, I don't want to just tell stories. I don't want to just sell in a PR capacity in the traditional agency style way, you know, and, 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 you're really obviously great at that boundary setting of like, this is what's important to me. And this is how I'm going to honor all of those things rather than, you know, I know I'm kind of guilty of doing this a lot where it's, this is what I believe in. And so I'm going to fight for all of these things, which is a very, it's very different verbiage. And it's also really overwhelming because I'm like, well, I, this is important. So I have to do it rather than what do I value the most? And what is what is the way that I am currently most capable of supporting? And I find it hard to let go of things. And I think, you know, for our audience, if you're starting up and you're starting these new businesses and having all of these ideas, I just want to say, you know, some of them, they're not going to be that you can't do all of them at the same time, just as you said, Crystal, you know, that it's, it's finding, okay, loving all of the things that come into your brain and knowing that they don't all have to happen straight away. Yeah. Oh, it's true. And there's, I love that Elizabeth Gilbert has a quote in Big Magic about oh. how ideas are constantly floating yeah. around. And she had, it, it's funny, but oh my gosh, because like I do actually have to share this because this is kind of funny. When I talk about how I had written a book back in the day, it was about an actress that moved from like a small town to California to try and become an actress, or she wanted to be an actress, she moved to California. And then basically overnight, she landed this like lead role and her life took off. And I never did anything with it for years. And then I would say about like four or five years ago, there was a TV show that came out. I think it was on the CW. It was like something lucky in love, but it was about a girl that, and what was the actress's name? She's blonde. Anyway, (laughs) there was a love triangle. There were so many similarities literally between what my name of my book was to what the TV show was about famous in love. That's what it was. Wow. And I sat back and I was like, holy shit, that was like my book. And so, and then I read Elizabeth Gilbert's book about how the same thing happened to her, where she had this idea for a book and she never did anything with it. And then someone else brought that book to life. And then it happened again recently where there was another book that I had. I wanted to write a book called Cruel Summer. I kind of had a sort of an idea in my head, but I really didn't have that one super fleshed out. And now there's like a new TV show called Cruel Summer. And I was like, girl, it's you amazing. guys are acting on these ideas because if you don't, they flutter off to someone else. They so. will. But then also on that note, some new new ones will come to you as well. Like oh, if, yeah. I, I think that's the love. I love that book so much. I've read it twice now. Um, and it, it really does remind you that, you know, cause I get it with songs. I'm like, I wrote that song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's that, you know, it happens in so many different capacities. Uh, yeah. but yeah, I really think that's, uh, that's an incredible book to read to just remind yourself that, you know, these Definitely ideas we, we say we're so, you know, we think that we're so smart. Um, and a lot of the times it's, you know, it's divine or whatever you want, universal inspiration, uh, that arrives. And if we don't have space for it, then they just move on. Yeah. You know, so that's why with this new book idea, I have, I, I chisel away at it every night. I write a nice. Sentence or yeah. Two. You're like, so I'm, I'm like, not letting you go. I'm not ignoring I'm not... you. Yeah. But until I'm married, you're not getting my full attention. And I, yeah, I, I think that's really important. I'm, I'm writing a book as well at the moment. And every Sunday I'm like, this is my non-negotiable because this is something I have to say. And I read it out yeah. loud and I say it to, to my friend, Mike, I like read the pieces that are where I'm up to and, and, and just make sure I put that time in. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank oh. you. We're, uh, you're going to get f- your inbox flooded with hopefully very thoughtful messages about how people have listened to the podcast and they're looking for a, a PR person. You're going to say, no, I'm sorry. I'm spending all of my time with Christina and Raquel now. That's it. That's it. Booking the plane tickets. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll put in the show notes, all of the, all of the links for all of the, all of the chat, like the charity and the, and the, um, the organizations that you support and that, that you're a part of and all the pies that you have your, your wonderful, glorious, um, glamorous fingers in. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for joining us and, and Thanks, yeah, I can't wait for you to visit us. Mimosas on, on the beach. 
I can't wait. Mimosas yeah. in the day and then we'll have Caesars at night because BC makes such good Caesars, I find. There was a yeah. place in Kitts Beach. I had a Caesar. Oh, it's so good. I want to go back there. <sighs> we'll find it. We'll find okay. it for you. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.